The storylines abound for the Buffalo Bills entering their Week 9 date with the Miami Dolphins, including the return of Von Miller. We're breaking that down for you, plus the injuries and my predictions for Sunday today on Locked on Bills. You are Locked on Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Well, folks, welcome in. Time for our last conversation before the Buffalo Bills host the Miami Dolphins in Week Nine and look to improve their record to seven and two on the season. We've got some newsy stuff to dive into here. In the opening segment, then we'll talk to Dr. Kyle Trimble of Banged Up Bills about the injuries. And lastly, my five predictions for Sunday to close out the week. The big news this week is Von Miller's back. His return to the lineup happens on Sunday against the Miami Dolphins. And I'm excited that I'm excited that Von Miller is back after what happened last year. And of course, the strong start that he had this season, three sacks in four games, looking like you know, kind of like old Von Miller, making an impact as a pass rusher, and I think he unlocks a lot for this defense. First of all, he's a good pass rusher, right? He's a good edge rusher, and he provides a speed and a bend dynamic off the edge that doesn't really exist in this pass rush arsenal without him. But I also feel like he also frees up some of the bigger body defensive ends that the Bills have to rush from interior gaps. Guys like Dewan Smoot, A.G. Epinesa, Greg Rousseau. Those guys can rush into your gaps with Von Miller now back part of the mix. And so I think your best ability to attack the pocket, your best group of pass rushers has been restored. And the Bills have been consistent with pressure all season long. But in the last four games without Von, their pressure to sack conversion rate has gone down a lot. They need their finisher back in. I'm excited for Vaughn to be back a part of the mix. And we really haven't seen an extended opportunity with both Vaughn Miller and Dewan Smoot available. And I think that that diversifies so much of this edge rotation and this defensive line group in general. So I'm excited for that. In addition to the return of Terrell Bernard, no injury designation, practiced in full on Friday. He's going to be back. And I think that's important against Miami. Quick passing game, right? Get Tua gets the ball out quick to his first read. They get a lot, a lot of yards after catch. And Terrell Bernard's the best coverage linebacker the Bills have and his ability to read the backfield, get into throwing lanes, cap routes, super good at it. He'll be a welcomed addition for this contest. Now, the Bills will be without Reggie Gilliam, the fullback. He's been ruled out for this game. And they only use him for a handful of snaps every game offensively. And I think that slack can be picked up by Quentin Morris if they want to have a fullback. But obviously, Reggie Gilliam's real value is as a four-phase special teamer. So I'm curious to kind of see who's able to step up and help on special teams. Now, the Dolphins, they've got some injuries of their own. Three critical players on defense. Zach Sealer, who I think is their best defensive lineman, he's ruled out. Cater Kohu, their slot corner, he's ruled out. And then Javon Holland, their starting safety, is doubtful. I don't know that he's going to play. So what does that mean? Well, for a defensive line that's already without Bradley Chubb and Jalen Phillips, Zach Sealer being out is a big hit. And they're going to be relying on Deshaun Hand and Benito Jones and Brandon Peely. These are not preferred options to start. They're going to have to start. With Cater Kohu out, that means Cam Smith, their second-round pick from last year, who has really not done anything in the NFL to this point, is going to have to play a lot for this defense. And he got a chance to play a lot last week for them against Arizona. It did not go well. It's a real opportunity for the Bills to have some mismatches in the secondary, not to mention Javon Holland's out. 
which means their starting safeties is going to be Marcus May and Jordan Poyer. We know Poyer struggled a lot this year. Marcus May hasn't played as much. The Bills could have some opportunities there with a safety tandem. That's not their preferred choices. Also ruled out for this game for Miami is Julian Hill, who's an important blocker for them. They run crack toss. They run wide zone. He's a big part of that blocking equation, so they're going to rely more on Durham Smythe. And uh, is it T Tanner Hudson? Is there other – or Tanner Connor? I can't remember his name. But there are other tight end that will have to come in and, and be a part of their mix. And so that blocking surface that they prefer with a lot of their outside run concepts is going to take a hit without Julian Hill. So a banged-up Dolphins team coming to Buffalo uh, with a lot on the line here. This is an important game for them. If they're going to have any chance of salvaging their season – they got to get this one. They're two and five, and they've had some bad losses along the way. And if it's going to happen, they 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 got to get this one. And you know, I have high expectations for the Bills in this game, but I'm also mindful of a desperate football team in a division game, right? I know the Bills have had a ton of success against Miami. Is it 14 of the last 16 they've been able to win? I get it, right? The Bills are are have earned the right for us to have a good uh, outlook on them to go win this game, but. Everybody thought the Baltimore Ravens were an absolute wagon, right? What happened last week in a division game? They lost to the Browns. The Browns were two and five, or whatever the record was, one and five. So the Bills got to take this game real serious. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. But I, I just, there's always that chance, right? And you think about the explosive playmakers that they have on offense. That's one thing. They're certainly banged up on defense, which gives me a lot of hope for the Bills being able to be very productive on offense. But there's a lot to be mindful of in this game, and you got to take care of your business at home, a desperate division rival coming to town, and uh, they got to have it, and they're banged up. So a lot of interesting dynamics for this football game. One quick newsy item here is the Bills released kicker Lucas Haversick from the practice squad. So Bills brought in some competition for Tyler Bass, and since then, Tyler Bass has made every kick. Now, they're all short kicks. That's got to be something we're mindful of. But I think his ball flight has been pretty pure watching him over the last couple of weeks. And even on one of the kicks, he overcame a high snap. Uh, so that's encouraging. And obviously, the Bills have seen enough from Tyler Bass or maybe enough from Lucas Haversick as well, who doesn't have much of a resume uh, to say, hey, we're good here. We can we can move on. And Tyler Bass, it's you know you're the kicker. But the corresponding move here is bringing back wide receiver Deion Kane. Uh, Deion Kane was with the Bills during the offseason, uh, flashed quite a bit in preseason, actually had some good production in preseason. And so the Bills have this deep inventory of options at receiver on their practice squad. I think they have at least three, maybe four receivers on the practice squad. And I think this is how the Bills manufacture a roster spot. You know, they only roster five receivers, and then they have this like bullpen that they can go to on the practice squad situationally if necessary. And so instead of rostering six, they just say, hey, we're going to roster five, bunch of different options on the practice squad. We'll use them as needed. It's kind of an interesting way that I think the Bills have used to their advantage to kind of finesse a roster spot. All right, folks, coming up on the other side of it, we're going to talk to Dr. Kyle Trimble of Banged Up Bills about the injuries. But before we do, I need to tell you about the sub stack that I, I recently launched. I'm writing articles. I'm having so much fun. been doing it since the start of the season, uh, writing at least three a week. But this is a big week that just happened. Five articles this week. The three you get every week. You get my big picture thoughts column coming out of the Bills game. You get a, a weekly Josh Allen scouting article, which is so fun. I love doing that. Tons of metrics, tons of context. You'll know exactly what's going on in every aspect of Josh Allen's game. And you get my weekly scouting matchup preview where I take every player from both teams. I show you how I grade every single player that's in the lineups. And I talk about, you know, where the real scouting matchups favor each team. But this week, since it's the end of the second quarter, the Bills just finished their second quarter. They're now uh, six and two on pace for a 12 win season. I go through and I grade every single component, pass D, run D, pass O, run O, and special teams. I give a bunch of metrics, a bunch of analysis, and I grade every function. I talk about what's working, what's not working. We think we pushed 2,000 words on that puppy that came out on Friday. So it's a great week to check out the Herd Mentality Substack. There's a link in today's show notes to be part of it. And um, you also have some incentives. Not only do you get these articles that I'm writing sent right to your email box, you get access to our Discord channel. 1,300 Bills fans in there talking Bills, daily polls, so many fun things that we do. I, I do basically 
an, an extra episode for them every single week. Wednesday nights, we do a herd mentality uh, hangout where I'm available. We basically go an hour, sometimes an hour and a half. Uh, you get a bonus episode basically where it's live and interactive. And you also get the all 22 review film clips. So you hear me talking about the clips that I put together for everybody. If you're part of the Substack, you get those as well. So check it out. There's a link in today's show notes to be part of all of that. All right, folks, Dr. Kyle Trimble up on the other side of it. Be sure to stick with me. There's nothing quite like being in the stadium, watching Josh Allen sling the ball around, throwing touchdown passes. If you want to get to a Bills game, you got to go to the Game Time app. Game Time is the fast and easy way to purchase tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. The app is awesome. It's easy to navigate. They give you flash deals. They give you a picture from your seat. They send the tickets straight to your phone so you don't have to dig through emails to find it. And they specialize in last-minute tickets. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code LOCKEDONNFL. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-F-L for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? It's Game Time. Our friends over at 5-Hour Energy know that being a passionate football fan isn't a hobby. It's a way of life. It takes a lot of energy to power through all-day tailgates, touchdown celebrations, or an agonizing overtime game, which is why they've created the Stand the Fan 5-Hour Energy Shot with a special flavor called Fan Fuel. That energy shot is made just for super fans like you, the fans who are first to the parking lot and the last ones to leave. We see you. 5-Hour Energy knows that no matter what team you're rooting for, being a fan requires heart, soul, and a whole lot of energy. Whether you're prepping for a big game tailgate or ironing your favorite jersey, your game day to-do list is always a mile long. That's why the limited edition Stand the Fan 5-Hour Energy Shot is here to help you stay fueled throughout the season. What's your fan fuel this week? Whatever it is, do it with a 5-Hour Energy. Available on 5HourEnergy.com, shipped nationwide. I'm joined now by Kyle Trimble. He's a doctor of physical therapy. He runs bangeduppills.com. You can follow him on Twitter at bangeduppills. He joins us each week to get us ready for the upcoming Bills game from an injury perspective. Got a few things to dive into here today. I want to start with Amari Cooper, wrist injury. And this is really weird because Sean McDermott has his Wednesday press conference. He says, Amari Cooper is going to miss today with a wrist injury. Then he doesn't. He practices in a limited capacity, the beat reporters in attendance were able to get video of him in full uniform, catching passes. I'm sure you've looked at all this video. What do you have for us on Amari Cooper, who practiced limited all week and is listed as questionable for Sunday? Yeah, he had the left uh, wrist taped up pretty heavily. Um, he was still catching passes. He was throwing the passes back with his right hand, though he might just be right-handed. But he definitely did something to the wrist and what was surprising was we knew he got nicked up during the game. It looked like he suffered a stinger. Uh, he got hit from the right side, step in the left, um, the head to the left. And he kind of went down and worked out his left shoulder arm area. And then it was surprising when they said that he was having a wrist injury, went back to look at the film and prior to where he got nicked up, where he suffered that, what I thought was a stinger. Um, he did something to his wrist. I can't really make it out on film what happened, but it almost looked like the wrist got sandwiched or got hit or something. Um, this is like midway through the second quarter and he was like kind of shaking it out and then kind of worked through it there and he still finished the game and whatnot, but, um, it was just surprising that there wasn't an issue until there was an issue. So it might've been the thing that he injures it, kind of works it out, plays through it, and then it swells up on later and he can't do as much stuff with it. Uh, as for whether he plays or not, his injury history suggests that he's going to play I and mean, he's played through a lot worse injuries. He said he's used to playing at, you know, 80 85 percent and it, at times even 55 60 percent where he can still get out there i i would say if he can get out there and block it all and if he can get out there and catch maybe they limit his his route tree because he can't do certain things i don't see how he doesn't play based off of his past history um but anything could change but the wrist with mark cooper could be a bigger thing for a wide receiver but with him i think it's gonna be a little bit less concerning given his uh, previous experience Let's go to the other wide receiver, Curtis Samuel, who missed last week with a pictorial injury, practiced in a limited capacity all week. Curious to get your thoughts here, and, and obviously I think we'll get a lot more clarity on Wednesday, or excuse me, on Saturday once the practice squad elevations are announced. Like if the Bills elevate a wide receiver, I think you could probably 
uh, read between the lines there and, and something's potentially not going to work out with Curtis Samuel or maybe even Amari Cooper. Perhaps they just want to reduce the reps anyways, like you mentioned, the blocking type situation. Curtis Samuel, you think he's got a chance this week? I mean, he has a chance. He is questionable. Yeah. Uh, you know, granted, he has a pectoral injury and the mechanism, like we talked about last week, really wasn't there for what I thought it was. But um, the bigger thing is, can, can he catch? Uh, can he block? Um, it might need another week. We see guys usually take a little bit of time for pectoral injury. You saw Terrell Bernard. We've seen him with other guys who need some time with that. My concern is, is he going to have to alligator arm catches so he doesn't get his arm out there and get, you know, it pulled away from his body and aggravate things? Is he going to have to wear a shoulder harness? Like, I don't know if the shoulder harness would be all that great for a wide receiver comparative to a linebacker or a defensive tackle who, you know, they can get most of the range of motion and still get by keeping their arms closer to their body. Um, I would, given the fact that Curtis Samuel has had so many injuries, he's missed time and just been ineffective. You almost want to say, hey, can you just sit out and get right? Maybe you can be healthy for the second half of the season and elevate somebody else. Because, I mean, I haven't really noticed a big difference whether Samuel is playing or not. I mean, I don't think he's even cracked 100 yards receiving total this year. So give him another week off. But, I mean, if they really feel he's an important part of the game plan, he could play. Yeah, I see what you mean there. It's a needle to thread. And I wonder how much Amari Cooper being a little bit hampered plays into any decisions there. So. I'm kind of expecting at least one wide receiver to be elevated from the practice squad where the Bills have several that they can consider. Obviously, Jalen Virgil elevated last week, and he went in motion a million times, never got the ball. But, you know, is that a function that he can handle and you kind of save Curtis Samuel and say, hey, look, hasn't really been going well. We want you to be right when you get out there and see if we can get this, you know, this vision for whatever this player is supposed to be for the offense for that to kind of come to fruition. One other player has a questionable designation and that's cornerback Christian Benford uh, he finished the game against Seattle but he's got a risk deal of his own limited participant in practice on Thursday and Friday after being full on Wednesday what's the pulse here this is an interesting one I'm not really sure what happened I did go to the film and look to try to find out what was happening and on my timeline I found two in, uh, instances in the fourth quarter where it could have happened uh, first one, he was trying to uh, wrap up a tackle and bail inspector kind of came from the other way to help out with the tackle from the one angle in the end zone. It looked like it was friendly fire, like the face mask face mask hit the, the right wrist and, and kind of banged it up a little bit. He didn't come up holding it or shaking out or anything like that, but that's just one possibility. We've seen a friendly fire can cause injuries uh, with the Teron Johnson injury earlier this year. Uh, the other option was um, a few minutes later, um, there was a kind of group tackle toward the uh, end zone and there's just a pile of bodies and Benford came down, I believe it was on his left wrist and kind of landed with his uh, fallen outstretched hand. And um, he didn't really favor that at all then too, but just imagine you're falling down, you have a whole bunch of extra bodies, all extra force coming through the wrist. He could have sprained it then. Uh, we know he talked to Atlanta Getzenberg after practice today and as he put it, it's straight that doesn't mean anything to me to be honest right. um but <laughs> you know whether that means hey i'm gonna play and it's fine um it's gonna come down to can he um you know engage with the wide receiver can he tackle can do with everything he needs to he could play with a, a some type of brace on that, that might limit his ability to uh grasp the wide receiver or collect interceptions but you know if he needs to be coverage guy out there like watching the film with him, there are times where he's not doing anything, but he's just playing effective coverage. And other times he has to get his nose in there. So um, I'd expect he tries playing, but we don't know the full extent of the risk. So if he does sit, it wouldn't surprise me. But I mean, we have enough quarterback depth that if he sits that, you know, Kyra Elam's right there and we have Cam Lewis and Jamarcus Ingram. So either way, I think we're okay, but it'd be preferable if uh, Benford does play, especially with Waddle and Hill playing. So three players questionable, Christian Benford, Amari Cooper, Curtis Samuel. Terrell Bernard has no designation. He practiced in full on Friday, every expectation that he's good to go for Sunday. But there is a player ruled out, Reggie Gilliam, the Bills fullback. And I don't think the fullback piece of this equation is the big one, right? I think they could probably have Q Morris do kind of whatever the five plays a game that he plays fullback. Obviously, Reggie Gilliam's a, a four-phase special teamer, and that's where uh, the loss will be most felt. It's a hip injury, if I'm not mistaken, for Reggie Gilliam. Do you have any intel on that? 
Um, nothing other than they said it happened during practice. I mean, that's the thing that sometimes frustrate with what I do is you see a designation and, um, what's funny is he was on the injury report for Wednesday and it said that he was fine. And then he, so he must have suffered the hip injury on Wednesday and then was limited, um, the next day or did not participate. So, uh, we had a discussion before we went on here, whether the Christian Benford injury happened during practice or afterward. And, you know, now talking about that, there's potential, it, both things could have happened. Benford's wrist injury could have happened during uh practice but the way it was um termed it seemed like it, it was fine but we know that gilliam did suffer the the hip injury during practice and uh, he's ruled out for at least this week one more pre- question here that's kind of it for this game but stefan diggs uh former bills receiver four great seasons in buffalo tore his acl this past week uh with the houston texans he's out for the entire season one of the questions that I've been getting a lot of, and including somebody that specifically said, hey, can you bring this up with Dr. Kyle Trimble, is based on it being a non-contact injury, is this something where there's an inevitability to his ACL potentially being vulnerable and lends itself to this potentially happening? Or is it more specific to the event, even if it's not non-contact, there's probably some mechanism there that would have made this happen. I think what this is kind of rooted in from the Bills' interest, Bills' fan interest, is did the Bills actually dodge a bullet? Was he probably going to tear his ACL this year, or is it just an unfortunate circumstance, even if it is non-contact? I'm leaning toward more unfortunate circumstance. The only way the Bills dodge a bullet is that he's not on the team. I mean, but it wasn't a foregone conclusion that he was destined to tear his ACL. It right. would have been awful had he torn his ACL with the Bills, but it's awful he tears his ACL with the Texans there's so many different variables to go into the ACL tear. Um, you know, the, the knee valgus angle when, when you, you know, step on the ground or whether you jump or, or sprint, uh, the, the turf we know is a big thing that the shoe, how much it sticks into the, the, the turf, whether it's turf or grass, um, hydration can be a big part of that fatigue, previous injury, um, yeah, how you land. Uh, it just, there's so many different things that go into, it. I mean, some of the injuries we've seen have just been so innocuous. You're like, towards ACL doing that. And it just, it's kind of a normal routine thing there. So I I wouldn't blame it on wear and tear or that he was destined to do it. It just sometimes just how it goes. And it's just unfortunate that he did that with an upcoming Houston Texans team. So um, one of my buddies that does this stuff, he does does more fancy football stuff. He looked at the knee valgus, um, uh, like how the knee kind of goes inward and the foot plants outward. And some guys have some crazy valgus uh, forces go through the knee and they don't have any issues. Like I know Jerry Judy is one that he's talked about who they really plant able to juke and they don't have any problems with the knees and other other guys who step into it. And then um, they have knee issues for different reasons. I believe he said Diggs was one of the higher up ones, but it's that correlation versus causation thing. Like, yeah, there might be a correlation between there's a higher valgus uh, angle you see with the knee when you're stepping through and jumping and whatnot, but is that always going to equate to an equal to an ACL tear? Uh, maybe eventually, but it's not like you have this and if you hit that certain number, then boom, you're going to have an ACL tear. It just comes down to they play a very physical sport. They're going as fast as, as hard as they can. And sometimes these things happen and, you know, it wasn't clear on film until, you know, they did diagnostic testing later anyway. He's Dr. Kyle Trimble, doctor of physical therapy. We're very fortunate that you join us each week to share your expertise. Thanks as always for doing this. And uh, we'll talk ahead of the Colts game next week. All right. Thank you, Joe and go Bills. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because right now new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. All right, folks, prediction time here on the podcast. I have five of them for you. Let's dive into it. Number one, I am predicting a season high in points allowed for the Miami Dolphins. Now, the Dolphins' defense has been decent this year. They're number 16 in the NFL in scoring defense. The most points they've given up 
31. The Bills got him for 31 in week two, and then the Tennessee Titans got him for 31 as well. I predict that the Buffalo Bills score 32 or more points against the Miami Dolphins this week, a season high allowed for the Dolphins. Number two, I am predicting a third straight week with a 100-yard wide receiver for the Buffalo Bills. Keon Coleman, two weeks ago, did it. Last week, Khalil Shakir did it. Put me down for somebody again this week. I'm not going to tell you who. Maybe it's Amari Cooper. Maybe it's Keon Coleman. Maybe it's Khalil Shakir. Maybe it's Dalton Kincaid. I don't know. I feel like someone's going to get it. I think there's going to be some good opportunities for the Buffalo Bills to throw the ball in this game. The Dolphins' pass rush is very limited by the players they don't have. No Zach Sealer, no Bradley Chubb, no Jalen Phillips. They're leaning into like Tyus Bowser and Chop Robinson and Emmanuel Agba as their best pass rushers. Bills are a good pass pro team in terms of winning those one-on-one battles up front. And then you think about who is missing from this Dolphins secondary and you know, leaning into guys like Cam Smith, no Javon Holland. It's going to be a tough go, in my opinion, there. There should be some real matchup advantages. And so I think the Bills get their third week in a row with a 100-yard wide receiver. Number three, put me down for the Bills getting a season high in rushing yards allowed against the Miami Dolphins. The most rushing yards that the Dolphins have given up in a game this year 155 to Indy. I think the Bills tag them for more than that. And this is a, rooted a lot in the injuries that their miss, you know, players are missing, right? No Zach Sealer. That's a big loss, not to mention the edge rushers. I think almost bigger than what Miami is missing is how I feel this Bills rushing offense is coming together. This zone blocking scheme is so good right now. Meanwhile, David Long, second-level defender, their linebacker, has really been all over the place with his run fits this season. No Javon Holland. They have some deficient safeties in terms of athleticism in Poyer and May. I think the Bills are going to have some good opportunities to run the ball. And obviously, James Cook had a big game against them last time, had a big explosive run. I think the Bills' run game is better today than it was then. I think there's a Ray Davis factor. I think the Bills are going to get a lot of rushing production against the Miami Dolphins. So put me down for at least 156 rushing yards. Now, number four and number five, I'm going to parlay together. I think the Bills win, and I think they cover the spread. The spread in this game, a little surprising to me. It's it's five and a half as of the recording of this podcast. Bills are favored by five and a half. I think they cover and I think they win the football game. So my five predictions this week. The Bills score 32 points or more against Miami, which would be a season high in points allowed for the Dolphins. A third consecutive week for the Buffalo Bills with a 100-yard wide receiver. And the Bills get a season high in rushing yards allowed against Miami. So 156 or more, the Bills win, and they win by six or more points, right? So they cover that spread. So there you have it, folks. The hay is in the barn. Done all we can on this podcast this week to get ready for this game. The only thing that's left to do is for the Buffalo Bills to go out there and win the game. All right, folks, tons of post-game coverage coming your way. You know all about it. We'll give you the post-game reaction, the All-22 review. Trade deadline is Tuesday, so there could be something that happens on that front. We'll have you covered every single step of the way. Would love it if you check out the Substack, folks. There's a link in today's show notes to be a part of it. You've heard me talk about the subtext as well. There's a link to join that. You want those in-game texts. You want the the reaction to every piece of Bill's news that comes through right to your cell phone. You can be part of that as well. Links in today's show notes. All right, folks, that's it. Hope you enjoy your weekend. Hope you enjoy football. As always, I kindly ask that you share, subscribe, rate, and review. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills. I look forward to catching up with you again real soon.